Hey, it's Erica. I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to Global News What Happened To ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. A flat road, large plumes of black smoke can be seen in the horizon. Children and soldiers are running away from the smoke with a clear look of despair on their faces. One girl stands out among the rest. She's naked, her arms held away from her body, her hands limp at her sides. The excruciating pain she's experiencing in that moment is palpable, even in black and white. I just cried as a child, too much pain. And then I scare and I just cry until I couldn't bear the pain, I pass out. Preserved in a photo, that moment showed the horrors of war on the most innocent. I'm journalist Erica Bella, and in this episode, I get to know the girl in that image that lives in our collective minds as she tells me how she became part of history. This is What Happened to Napalm Girl. The photo was snapped by Associated Press photographer Nick Oot on June 8, 1972. It's titled The Terror of War, but most people call it another name. Napalm Girl. Kim Fook was the nine-year-old girl seen running in agony moments after napalm bombs fell from the sky over the village of Trongbong, where she lived. It's about an hour away from the city formerly known as Saigon. The Vietnam War started in the mid-1950s, well before Kim was born. She said even though she grew up in the midst of war, it never really impacted her early childhood. I just enjoy uh, with all we had, we had everything. Kind of, we we really rich because we have the huge farm, the land that my great uncle helped my mom. You know, it's so, but be honest, every time I walk home from the school uh, with all my uh, friends from the village. Every time I got into the gate of my house, you know what? I still feel that good, good feeling that I felt like I am. I was a princess. To understand Kim's story, we first need to understand the Vietnam War. And for that, I turned to Edward Miller. He's a history professor at Dartmouth College. I remember watching classic Vietnam War films when I was in high school growing up in Michigan, films like Platoon and Apocalypse Now and Full Metal Jacket. I I took a course in college on the Vietnam War and uh, was really intrigued. But I think I didn't really get into studying the, my my interest professionally is more in the, the Vietnamese dimensions of the Vietnam War. And that was something that I really didn't start to think about until I actually lived in Asia. After I I went to college, I lived for a couple of years in Taiwan. Edward has spent years studying the history of the Vietnam War. And he said there were many events that led up to the war before the mid-50s. The primary axis of conflict was between the French and the, the Viet Minh movement. That war ended in 1954, but it ended with a compromise peace. Uh, the, the Viet Minh, the Vietnamese communists led by Ho Chi Minh, won this big battle at Dien Bien Phu. But despite winning that battle, they still ended up with this compromise peace where Vietnam was divided North Vietnam under the control of Ho Chi Minh and the communists, South Vietnam under the, the control of an, of an anti-communist government. And so in a very real sense, the, some of the fundamental divisions and, and the fundamental underlying conflicts in that first war were unresolved. And so the second Indochina war, the war that we know as the Vietnam War, really comes out of, of that, that first war. The peace agreement that came out of the Indochina War didn't fix the underlying conflicts, but it did end the French colonial rule in Vietnam. There's this uh, big question looming over Vietnam, which is what kind of independent post-colonial country is Vietnam going to be? 
And of course, Ho Chi Minh and the communists, they had their idea. They thought that, that, that Vietnam should be part of the communist camp, of the socialist camp led by the, the Soviet Union, uh, and which also included um, uh, the People's Republic of China. But there were a lot of other Vietnamese uh, who disagreed with that, who, who felt that um, post-colonial Vietnam should look uh, very differently. They thought that, that there should be uh, some kind of, of non-communist Vietnam. Edward said the divide wasn't just ideological, it was also territorial. One of the, the provisions of the, the peace agreement, the Geneva Accords, which ended the war, was free movement for a period of, of almost a year, 300 days. Anybody who wanted to move from communist-controlled north to the south could do so, and vice versa. People could go from the south to the north. And a huge number of people ended up moving from North Vietnam to the south. Nearly a million people did so. And, and most of them did so because they didn't want to live under communist rule, and they, they felt that, that Vietnam should go in a different direction. And so in a, in a real sense, this is, this is what the Vietnam War is about. Edward said that because of the Cold War, there was U.S. interest in the region, and in the mid-1960s, American combat troops were sent to support the South. There were multiple coordinated attacks on the South by Northern forces. One of the most notable was the Tet Offensive in 1968 where North Vietnamese launched attacks on more than 100 cities and outposts in South Vietnam. Fighting escalated again in March 1971, when Northern Communist forces launched a new offensive in the South, which Americans called the Easter Offensive. The Vietnamese called it the Spring 72 Offensive. This was the biggest offensive operation that the communists had undertaken since the Tet Offensive four years earlier. So this was a big deal. And it was, in hindsight, uh, the communist attempt to try to win the Vietnam War militarily. They had calculated, they had rebuilt their forces from the losses of the Tet Offensive, and they were were calculating that they could could cut South Vietnam in half and, and win the war in 1972. And this offensive is ultimately what brought the Vietnam War directly to to Kim Phuc's village, uh, the village of Trang Ban. And uh, there was a great one prong of the communist offensive came across the border from Cambodia into the provinces north and west of Saigon, which is where Trang Bang is located. And so that was the reason that there were North Vietnamese combat forces that were operating in the area around the village along with with Viet Cong guerrillas. And that's the reason why there was uh, fighting in the area. And and the reason why on on June 8th, it was known that there was likely to be combat in the village. The war spilled into the village of Trang Bang and knocked on Kim's door. Now, there was also the question of the United States and American forces, because American forces are still engaged in the Vietnam War in 1972. But the form and the level of that engagement is much different. U.S. forces in Vietnam actually peaked in 1969, in the first year of Richard Nixon's administration. And after 1969, the number of American troops in Vietnam actually steadily went down. Nixon began a unilateral withdrawal from Vietnam. And this was very much part of Nixon's strategy. He was determined to get the United States out of Vietnam. However, He wasn't going to do it uh, at any price. He wasn't going to just pull out of Vietnam, and he didn't feel he could afford to do that. So what Nixon was pursuing is what he called peace with honor. So what he was doing was he was pulling U.S. forces out, but he was actually selectively escalating the war at the same time. He was trying to use especially U.S. air and naval forces to try to increase the violence in, in certain targeted ways. So in 1970, he invades Cambodia, the the first overt ground invasion of the war uh, into Cambodia. He also undertakes uh, various uh, bombing operations in North Vietnam and in Laos and and Cambodia. So so the overall U.S. involvement in the war and the number of American casualties is falling in the early 1970s. But the war is still going on. The war is intensifying. And the United States is still very much engaged in the war. The Vietnam War is intensifying in in 1972. 
and especially the fighting among the Vietnamese is intensifying. That's when local communist operatives arrived at Kim's family's doorstep. So they say to my mom, we want to stay to occupy your place. And so my mom knew right away the war will come. So she tried to uh, take all her family uh, to move out of the house because she's, she knew it a, will be dangerous. Kim's mother moved her family to a Khao Dai temple in their village. She thought it's a good, uh, safe place and a holy place that would be safe. But believe me, in the wartime, no place to be safe. She said the temple was located just outside the village near the highway. We hiding in the temple with another villagers and a South Vietnamese soldiers. So we, we, we moved there. Then we stayed there for three days. And on the third day, I remember as a children, we just allowed to play inside of the temple courtyard and play together nearby the bomb shelter. Then suddenly, uh, I still remember after lunch, then, you know, the so- South Vietnamese soldiers, they yelled for us and asked us to run. Kim and her family ran to the road and a warning, what happened next is graphic and it changed Kim's life forever. I saw the airplane it was so, so fast, so loud, two words to me. And I stood right there. I didn't run. Then I turned my head and looked up and I saw the airplane and I saw four bombs, four bombs landing down like that. And I heard the noise. Boop, 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 boop. I still remember very clear. And so, wow. Suddenly the fire everywhere around me. And my, my clothes were burned off by the fire. And I saw the fire jet over my left arm. And I used my right hand. I wrap it up. Then at that moment, I remember I, I was so scared. At that moment, I was so terrified. Then I thank God that moment. Because my feet weren't burned. All my, from my neck down, got all burned. But my feet still okay. I was able to run out of that fire. And then I saw my brothers. And I saw my cousins. And I saw all, uh, some of the soldiers there. And all of us together kept running and running and running, crying, yelling. And for a while, and I, I was so tired to run anymore. And I remember I saw um, some people, they stood on the road. And then I stopped. I stopped. Then I cry out, too hot, too hot. Nick Oot was a journalist with the Associated Press, documenting the battle for the once peaceful village of Trong Bong. I saw Kim without her arm running. I said, why? She don't have the clothes. Why she's naked? Then I run closer, closer. I took more pictures of her. I saw her arm um, and her, her body burned so badly. Kim said there were soldiers at the side of the road. They tried to help me, gave me some water to drink. And then he tried to, to help me. He poured water over me. And so that moment, I think they they didn't realize that when they pour the water over me, is with reaction with 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 napalm, uh, and then it's mean like cook more, and I lost. This mean like the burn is get deeper, and so 
I, I lost consciousness and I didn't remember anything what happened next. Covered in third degree burns, Kim Fook lost all consciousness and she was on the brink of death. Kim Fook laid in the middle of Highway 1, the main road in Trung Bang, and she was badly injured. Edward Miller explains the photo wasn't a fluke. One of the reasons that the photograph was taken was that Nick Ut, the, the photographer, he was tipped off the day before that there was going to be combat in and around Trung Bang because the communists had massed their forces there and the South Vietnamese were aware of this. And, and so there was very likely going to be fighting there. And that's why he, along with, with many other journalists, went out uh, to the site and, and were able to witness the fighting, including the napalm attack in which uh, Kim Fook was injured. And a pivotal location to the war was the very road Kim was on. The highway is very important, especially in light of the, the communist goals for the offensive, which were to try to to cut South Vietnamese uh, supply lines and, and to uh, isolate uh, South Vietnam. So if you, if you follow the road that Trang Bang is located on and, and you go out uh, to the west towards Cambodia, the, the, the big city that's still inside South Vietnam near the border with Cambodia is the city of Da Nang. And that was a, a very important um, South Vietnamese controlled stronghold. And so if the communists were able to, uh, to, to cut this road and to, to capture uh, Trang Bang and to hold it, then uh, potentially uh, Da Ning would be isolated from, um, uh, from, from, uh, from Saigon and from, from the rest of uh, the, the South Vietnamese uh, military forces. Uh, this is a so-called friendly fire incident in which the pilots were supposed to be attacking North Vietnamese soldiers that were in the area, but they end up hitting uh, this, this group of civilians. Nick Ut, the photographer, told Kim he was the one that took her to the closest hospital. After he took my picture, then he saw my, my body burn so badly, and uh, he's just so afraid of that I die. Then he, he, he put down his camera and... Uh, he tried to help me, and someone uh, say that how how we how they can take all the people who wounded to the hospital. And Uncle Uk was right there, and so with he, his uh, driver, and um, he he put all the people who wounded, included me, and so he told me that he. Uh, uh, arrived the hospital uh, nearby, uh, nearby my village, and so he just uh, dropped us there. But uh, the 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 people who admitted in, uh, us in, they say no, you 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 have to take them to Saigon, a big city. The reason why, uh, because. Uh, they, they, they are just a small village, um, small hospital, just like similar like clinic or something like that. Uh, we don't have enough um, uh, condition to, to take care of the severely burned patient like that. And so they, they reject it. They didn't want to take us in. And they asked Uncle Ud, just move, move, move. And he say, right now, you know, she's dying. And if you don't take them in, uh, and if I take her to Saigon, we'll be, she will be die, you know. And then, uh, and they just really know, didn't want to take it. And then Uncle Ud took out, uh, show his uh, journalist pass uh, of uh, IP, you know. And it, he said that if you don't take them in, tomorrow we'll be big article in the front of the newspaper. And, and that is so bad, you know, reputation. And so that's why they finally, they took me in. Fluttering between life and death, Kim was at the hospital alone 
as she was transferred to a hospital in Saigon. Her family was desperately trying to find her, but no one knew where she was. She went to the first children's hospital in Saigon. Of course, I didn't remember where I was. (laughs) And she said that she was with my brother and then looking into the hospital, but they couldn't see me anywhere. And so finally, uh, she asked some people there and she described that what day that I got burned and I was about nine years old and 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 where where is the the part uh, department for burn you know and uh, they went there they asking everyone and uh, finally she couldn't find me anywhere and then someone told told her that uh, if you don't see her here in the floor so the, 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 the only place that you can see her, find her, in the morgue. After a three-day journey to Saigon, Kim's mother and brother finally found her. She saw me and she re- recognized that me. Then she just uh, picked me up. And she said, it's so stink because three days, nobody take care of. And... And she says, uh, some, uh, it's just so terrible. They just expecting to bring my body back to the village for burial. But my mom say, she still heard that I still have very weak breath. It was a miracle. Kim was still breathing. You had to know that in the war time, there were so many children got wounded, patient, and then they just focus on which one who survived. And I, I, I absolutely no more hope. The hospital was inundated with patients, and Kim wasn't receiving the medical care that she so desperately needed. She seemed unlikely to survive. But then her father connected with an old friend who was a doctor at the hospital. They recognized each other. And then my my dad uh, gained uh, his help. Uh, His uh, his, his friend helped me. He said, you know, right now my, my, my girl, my daughter got burned so badly. Now, um... Whatever uh, uh, solution you can help um, her. The doctor called a nearby burn clinic, and immediately Kim was transported to the clinic for treatment. Kim's body was covered in burns. She was badly dehydrated. They attempted a blood transfusion, but it didn't work because her blood wasn't flowing through her body. She said they tried again, this time using a larger vein in her leg. The doctor said when, you know, the blood started to move in your body, everybody clapped, Say yes, she's safe because the blood moving. And that, that's the moment is mean like I still alive. I still survive. And that is a started to have a treatment. I was in uh, IUC or something special room in the, in order to prevent all the infe- uh, infection, and uh, the treatment come along. Sixty five percent of her body was covered in burns. That's because napalm is an incendiary mixture of a gelling agent and a volatile petrochemical, which is usually gasoline or diesel fuel that burns at temperatures ranging from 800 to 1,200 degrees Celsius. In addition, it burns longer than gasoline, it's more easily dispersed, and it sticks to targets. So you can imagine what it did to Kim's nine-year-old body. And again, the following details are graphic. I just cry as a child, too much pain. 
and then I scare and I just cry until I couldn't bear the pain. I pass out. I pass out. That is such a child. And every day they have to do that. I hated that time. I thought it's a death time for me. I wish my memory not come back. But because they treat me all the, the blood uh, intervener, all of that, you know, in order I, my, my body can gain all uh, strength. And so they started to do um, treatment. Uh, but they have to cut all my dead skin off. Uh, because the thing, if you still have a dead skin on my body, it's so easy to get infection. She had spent 14 months in hospital. In total, she had 17 operations. But Kim Fook was alive. I didn't see that picture until... I came home from the hospital 14 months later. I went home and my, my dad gave it to me, my picture. And he say, Kim, this is your picture. And I look at that, I say, what? Why you took my picture like this? Naked, I a little girl. It was so ugly. I, I feel ashamed, you know? And, and I, I hate that picture. I hated it. As much as she wanted the photo to disappear, it was printed in newspapers around the world, including the front page of the New York Times on June 9, 1972, the day after Nick Oot snapped it. Then it went on to win a Pulitzer Prize in 1973 for spot news photography. And Nick Oot, the man behind the camera, believed the photo accomplished something even more important. When I looked at that picture, I think that picture came to war right away. But the war didn't officially end until three years after the photo was taken, in 1975. The photo did, however, help bolster the public's perception in the U.S. Here's Edward Miller to explain what unfolded. Less than a year after this photograph was taken, in January of 1973, a, a so-called peace agreement called the Paris Accords was signed by the United States and, and North Vietnam and also South Vietnam, although South Vietnam really had to be pressured to, to go along with that agreement. Richard Nixon portrayed this as his peace with honor moment. He, he argued that this was a peace agreement that would end the Vietnam War. And in, in fact, it did no such thing. Uh, it allowed the United States to withdraw its few remaining troops from South Vietnam and also to get its prisoners of war back that North Vietnam was holding. But other than that, the war just continued as before. I do think that when we think about the impact in the United States, the, the United States and most Americans were extremely tired of the Vietnam War by 1972. And so I think this photograph was taken as confirmation by many Americans that ending the American involvement in the Vietnam War, even if that didn't actually end the fighting between the two Vietnamese states, that ending that American involvement was the, the right thing to do. In 1975, communist forces took control of South Vietnam, declaring victory. The war was over. Meanwhile, Kim's recovery was long and arduous. Even after the war had ended, years after she was injured, she was still dealing with the repercussions. Dealing with physical that I allowed to go home, that is because I got better. But dealing with nightmare, now emotional pain come along because in the hospital, for me as a child, I thought everyone is the same as me because I look everywhere who has something end up in the hospital, <laughs> right? But when home, oh, just me. No one got wounded like me. And my friend just looked so scared of me. And I feel like unfit to be loved. 
Kim said there was one thing that motivated her to keep going. I'm so thankful that my mom, my family, my dad, my all this, they just be there for me. I think I gain a lot from their love. And I, I never, even then, I never take for granted. That love helped her heal. And Kim says it galvanized her to pursue a career in medicine. One day, I become a doctor. That the only dream I has. Then I make my dream big. And I just really wanted to study, to get into medicine school. As she recovered, she was ready to move on and had big dreams in front of her. Except there was one thing that kept pulling her back to that day, that black and white photo. By 1982, Kim had enrolled in her first year in medical school. She had spent the previous decade recovering physically and emotionally from the pain she endured after a napalm bomb dropped on her village. But just as she focused on creating a new identity for herself, she was rediscovered. So it seemed to me like another tragedy came along because I am the subject. I was that little girl being a very famous picture around the world. So the journalists from different countries came to Vietnam and they wanted to interview me, filming me. It wasn't long before the Vietnamese government began pursuing Kim to use the iconic photo in her story as propaganda, as a war symbol for the state. She says she was pulled out of school. This really affected my life. And I continue to hate that picture. I didn't want anybody to recognize me. I want to live alone. Unfortunately, they cut short my study. They didn't allow me to stay in Saigon, big city, to continue to study, to fulfill my dream, my ambition, my my hopes, all gone. She was 19 years old. It built me up with hatred, bitterness, and anger. I hated even my own life. No longer able to study and filled with anger, Kim turned to a place where she found comfort. So I spent my daytime in the library searching for the answer. Why me? What the purpose in my life? Why I have to suffer? that much, on and on and on, <laughs> not, not let me alone. And so I went to the big library in Saigon, and then I poured out all the religious books, reading, reading, searching, searching. And among of the book I read, is a, it was a, the New Testament, the Bible. She discovered Christianity. And she says that's when everything began to change for her. She was able to forgive. In 1986, she was granted permission to continue her studies in Cuba. There, she met another Vietnamese student. And by 1992, she got married. I met my husband in Cuba. Uh, In 1986, Vietnamese government sent me to Cuba to study. And then until 1982, I got married. And uh, after married, we have permission to go to Moscow for our honeymoon and on the way back to Cuba again. So we have a schedule to stop in Gander, Newfoundland for one hour to refuel. Then I, I pray, God help me, I, because I didn't know anything how to make it. And finally, uh, I make it. I stayed with my husband in Gander in October 15, 1992. The couple defected. They asked for and were granted political asylum in Canada as political refugees. Okay, now, stay in Canada. Be honest. 
I am so thankful to Canadian government and the people Canadian. Um, people say to me, oh, Canada is so cold, the weather. But I always say to them, the heart of the people is very warm. And I am so thankful that I have freedom in Canada. And then my life I, with my husband, we have uh, two boys, Thomas and Stephen. And now uh, I adopted my, uh, another girl as my, my girl. And we have uh, five grandchildren. As she built a new life for herself in Canada, she said she wanted to create a new identity and detach from the ugliness of war and the photo taken of her when she was just nine years old. The war, it could cost my private life. Enough already. Enough is enough. And so I believe in freedom. I can build my own life. But unfortunately, in 19. A, uh, in 1995, the journalists, they found me in May 1995. The article all over, they say, in the front, in the front, uh, uh, front page, <laughs> because she took my picture, right? And they say, the article, Kim Fook, living, of course, the Napalm Girl living in the Metro Toronto, Canada. Now, how can I, how can I, you know, hide from there? By the time she was discovered in Toronto, a lot had changed. She had given birth a year earlier to her first child, her son, Thomas. It moved me to the moment that in my mind, in my soul, I say to myself, Kim, that picture not let me go. I should go back to work with it for peace. It is my choice because I became a mother. I have my baby. And how can I, how can I see my child suffer like that little girl? No, absolutely. I have to do my best in my life to protect them, to educate them, to do something to prevent that happen again. Not only for my boy, my baby, but all the children around the world. So that moved me to dedicate it, my life, to dedicate my life to go back to work with that picture. And the moment I thought about that, wow, Erica, that picture became a powerful gift for me. I just love it. I just embrace it. I'm not embarrassed anymore. I just embrace that picture, working with it. And that is change, the whole point of view of me not run away anymore. Go back to accepted it. And that is powerful gift for me, working to help children. So that's the answer. How can I see my picture 50 years later? It's a powerful gift for me as a mother, as a grandmother, and as a survival calling out for Peace, please, working, everyone, working for peace. Since the Vietnam War ended in 1975, a lot has changed in the country. And although it has become very much a globalized country, the Communist Party remains in power. Kim has not been able to return. Kim continues to live with both the physical and emotional scars left behind by war. The horrors of war captured in that iconic photo, which she now uses as a tool. She has created Kim Foundation International, which focuses on the needs of children of war. 
Yeah, we just focus on building the school, um, hospital, library for children, uh, often his home. That we uh, we uh, we have that mission. For me, my heart, my 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 goal is education is the number one for people, helping them to think, you know, and loving them, you know. And that's a for all my life fighting for peace, for love, for hope, and forgiveness. That is, I, I'm so happy that I still survive. Uh, I'm, I'm still here, but not as a victims of war, like 50 years ago with that picture. Now I, I present a new picture, the new picture in my life after 50 years. I bring to people everyone around the world, the picture of hope, of love and forgiveness. And we need to live like that. Like much of the world, Kim has been watching what has been unfolding in Ukraine. It's something she says brings her great pain. My mom and I cry all the time because that is bring me back, bring her back with the thing that we have been there, exactly destroy our house. We wounded and people die in the front of us. Everything, how can we deal with that? It's not easy. That's why my heart is broken for all the people who lost their life. And it's so hard for me to deal with 50 years later. I can see that. I never cry for myself, but I cry for people, for children. And it's her motivation to continue to advocate and fight for a world where children are safe from the terror of war. Thank you for joining me this week. Global News, What Happened To is written and produced by me, Erica Vela, with producer Dila Velezquez. Our audio producers are Rosalind Kufour and Rob Johnson. Also, a special thanks goes to Drew Hasselbeck, supervising national online journalist for Global News. Let us know what you thought of this episode and please share it with a friend. It will help us grow the show and bring you more incredible stories. You can also help us out by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. You can also reach out to me personally. We are always looking for stories. So if there's a new story you want us to revisit, you can reach me on Twitter at Erica Vela or email me at erica.vela at globalnews.ca. Thanks so much and we'll see you next time.